Today we're taking a look at an offensive security phishing framework I've created called Redler. We've got a live demo we're going to hop into shortly, but before that I've got a quick three slides I want to cover. A little bit about me. My name is Matt Creel and I'm a senior cybersecurity analyst at Shiner Downs. We're a firm based out of Pittsburgh and Columbus offering a variety of security consulting services. I've been with the company since early 2017, and most of my focus during that time has been performing penetration testing and offensive services for clients. Within our team, I sort of serve as the de facto developer when we need something built or edited, although I don't have a formal software engineering background. I've also been assigned several incident response cases, so although my focus is on the offensive side of security, I do have some experience on the other side of the fence. One of the areas I've spent the most time working in and developing for us is phishing, which we're here to talk about today. So why Redler? We've used multiple different phishing tools and platforms since I joined the team, and with each of them, we felt there was probably something out there that better suited our needs. Eventually, we decided to delve in creating our own, which became Redler, and these became the goals for the project. One of our top priorities was the ability to be running and managing several phishing campaigns at once, whether that be multiple phishing campaigns running off a single server, or campaigns running off of separate servers. Also high on the list, the ability to chain templated web pages together in a way that mimics the user experience on popular cloud email services where usernames and passwords are submitted on sequential web pages. We think this is a must for phishing in today's environment. We also have a need to be able to quickly add on to existing infrastructure when we need it and quickly tear it down when that gets burned. In the event of wanting our phishing servers getting burned and we tear it down, we don't want to lose all of our phishing templates and data. We wanted all data stored somewhere centralized that could manage other phishing servers and perform remote actions for us, such as generating SSL certificates. Encryption of sensitive data was also important, mostly for revolving around phishing data, such as user submitted form data and SMTP credentials. On the payload delivery side, we also wanted an integrated way to be able to serve payloads instead of exposing our C2 infrastructure by hosting our payload from our Cobalt Strike web server or something similar to that. And lastly, we also wanted a way to still be able to track information regarding our phishing targets, such as IP addresses, user agents, but also click counts, opened email accounts, because a lot of our clients still care about those statistics. Last bit before we get over to the demonstration. Redler is broken down into three parts, and this is how our environment is structured. The Redler console is the main backend written in Flask and Python, which stores your templates, tracks your campaigns, and manages your remote phishing servers. The client is a web interface written in Angular 7 that allows you to interact with the exposed console endpoints via a GUI. And I run the client and the console off the same server. The last component are your Redler workers, which is another Python API that you run on separate servers. Ideally, you can add as many workers to your phishing infrastructure as you require. The workers are what actually runs your phishing web servers and sends statistics and form data back to the console. So we fire off this whole environment and then just open up the workers' web ports to the internet for our phishing targets to hit. Now let's transition over to the demo. So we're here at the Redler login page, and you can see the web interface that I'm connected to is running on winterfish.com off port 4200. Down here in the console bar, you can see the Redler console I've specified we're going to be logging into and connecting to is same domain, but off port 5000. So again, these are running on the same server, just different ports. So we'll go ahead and log in. And we've got a bit of a Game of Thrones theme here, so we're going to be logging in as Jon Snow. And when you log in, you're first presented with the Workspaces page. We'll come back to this page in a minute. The first page I actually want to cover is the Domains and Servers page. The Domains and Servers component is where you manage your Redler workers and your phishing domains. On the server side, you can see I have three Redler workers connected with my console. And ideally, you could integrate as many of these as you want with a single console. In our production phishing environment, we're running quite a few of these. For each worker on the table, there's a couple actions you can take. You can check its status to make sure that uh, worker to console and console to worker communications are working. You can upload files to, to the worker and delete files off the worker. Anything uploaded here gets copied over to the static folder of your web server. Um, so you can upload resource files here for your HTML templates or payloads to be served. 
And we can also check what ports are currently bound to on the worker. So um, if we're running a phishing campaign off of port 443, we'll, you know, we'd see that here that this that the port's taken up. We'd want to fish off of something like 80. Um, so you can actually you can actually be running campaigns in parallel off these workers. You could have a campaign running on worker two on four four three and on eighty, or you could have campaigns running on one workers one two and three all off port four four three. Those can all be managed from the single interface here. The API key up here actually has to be entered into a config file on the worker manually. So when the console goes to present uh, campaign configs to the worker and gives it the HTML templates to host. Um, this API key is sent with it, and if it does not match, that kind of communication will fail. Uh, on the reverse side, when the worker is sending data back to the console, statistics updates, clicks, opens, form data, the API key is sent from the worker to the console, and again, if the API key does not match on either end, the communications will fail. On the domain side, we can see the two domains I bought configured for the purposes of the demo. Domains are only usable if the domain resolves to one of the IP addresses of your Redler workers over on the server side. And once added to the table, there's a couple actions we can take again. The refresh button will resolve the domain to an IP address and update the value shown here in the table. And the green lock will generate SSL certs using Let's Encrypt for your domain. I'll go ahead and do that for Bravos Logistics here. The search has been successfully generated, and we can see that the certain key paths have been updated with the default paths of Let's Encrypt certs. So if you're not using Let's Encrypt for SSL certs, you can come in here and also specify the paths to your custom uh, certain key in the interface here. Next, we'll briefly cover the users and roles component. So this page is only accessible to users who have been assigned a administrator type role. And from here, you can add and delete users, reset passwords, and also change what roles users are, are, are assigned to. So in the users table here, we can see the admin user and JSnow user have been assigned the Redler admin role, and the STarly account has been assigned the Night's Watch role. On the role side, you can add and delete roles, but also edit the permissions assigned to each role. So the Redler admin role here, which is an administrator role, it has the ability to view all of the workspaces accessible via the console. So uh, you can delegate these just by unchecking and checking the boxes here. And the Night's Watch role, which is a user type role, only has access to two of the several workspaces available via the console. So as an example, I use this feature all the time to delegate access to our interns to ensure that they only have access to the current engagements that they're working on and not all of the projects that we're doing at that time. And right now there's only two role types. There's the administrator types and the user types. And the differences between these are that the administrator roles get added automatically to all newly created workspaces. And the administrator roles have the ability to access this users and roles page to perform administrative functions. With that, let's move back over to the Workspaces page. Workspaces are really just buckets that are there to help you organize your phishing engagements or projects. Phishing templates and results, including statistics and credentials from one workspace, will not be viewable outside of that workspace. The exception to this is the general workspace. Any templates you add to the general workspace will be usable in campaigns within other workspaces, although they will only be editable from the general workspace. This workspace is really there just to help you declutter the rest of the interface. So now let's enter our Casterly Rock workspace. You can see a bunch of new tabs just appeared on the nav bar, which contain this workspace's templates and data. The results page, which we're on now, shows all the statistics from our current and previous campaigns. From here, we can see all the campaigns in this work workspace, filter the results by campaign, and drill down into the results. Each of these result categories is exclusive, so users who have submitted creds do not also count in the clicked or opened category. It is assumed that to submit creds, the link was clicked and the email was opened. The download category tracks users who downloaded a payload or a file from your phishing site. 
My team often doesn't send direct attachments, so instead we'll have our file download automatically from a web page. Clicking on a category, we can see targets who belong to it. And going a little bit further, we can see information about each user, including the timestamps of different actions and the associated IPs and user agents. Submitted form data appears down here in the credential vault. Clicking a row, we can see all of the form data submitted. And there's also a couple graphs available for reporting. That pretty much wraps up the results component. Let's move on to our phishing templates and get ready to prep a new campaign. The emails component houses our email templates, and I've got a couple already loaded in here. We'll go ahead and just pick one to edit. So everything's edited via HTML on the back end, and you can preview it in an iframe here. You can see we're working with a template that uh, is dealing with email availability issues. Some security changes have been made. Just got to go log in and make sure that access has not been affected. And we're impersonating Maester Picel here, our Maester of Network Communications. You can see there's a couple of variables in here. So we've got the first name variable there, as well as a URL variable here. And there's a couple more that are available for use in emails. So the URL variable will just simply take users to your initial landing page. The payload URL will take users directly to your hosted payload. So this link should just simply download a file if you configure the campaign to use a payload when you set it up. And the rest of the variables here, first name, last name, full name, email, and ID are just going to be unique variables based on the recipient. Email tracking is also on by default and you can toggle this on and off. This will simply include the one by one pixel image at the bottom of the email where if it's rendered, you can deduce that your target has opened the email. The pages component is very similar to the email component. And this is where you store your HTML templates for your phishing web pages. I've got one template preloaded here in the Casterly Rock workspace. But the login templates we're going to be using with our email availability scenario are actually kept in the general workspace for now. So let's backtrack over there so we can edit them. And again, even though these two templates are only editable in the um, pages component of the general workspace, these will be available for selection with campaigns in any workspace. So we've got our username and password pages here. Let's pop these open just for a preview. And this is actually one of the best features about Redler is that you have the ability to chain up to four of your templated web pages together during any one campaign. So this can help you create a dynamic scenario or accurately mimic the user experience for you know, your particular targeted site. Let's go in and edit one of these now. So we can see this is the same HTML editor that the emails component has. Got the same iframe preview. We also got the ability to clone a site. And we also can specify the trailing URL path that this specific web page is going to be hosted on. Again, we've also got several variables that can be used. So the next URL variable is the variable you're going to be using the most. And this is how you tie your template of web pages together. So down in our form here on the username page, we can see the action attribute is just set to the next URL variable. This will get dynamically replaced at runtime with the trailing URL path of your second page in the sequence. So that'll be replaced with this value here and bring users over to the password page when they submit their username. The payload URL variable is the same as the payload URL variable available in the emails. And again, this will let you use a button or a hyperlink to directly download the specified payload configured with your campaign. The serve payload variable is a little bit different from the payload URL variable in that you can just include this anywhere in your HTML template and it will get replaced at runtime with a HTML meta tag, kind of like down here. And when someone browses to your page, 
it should automatically drop your specified payload to their file system without any type of button or hyperlink click. And for both of these, um, when using either of these, the tracking integrity is maintained. So the, the specific user ID of whoever's browsing your site at that moment will be inserted here in the payload URL so you can continue to track who exactly is downloading your payloads. The final three variables down here, login FMT, username, and email, are there to help you mimic user experiences and do sort of a variable pass through. So if we check our password page here, we can see we've got the login FMT value specified above our enter password header. And this will let us grab the value of uh, an input box with the login FMT name from the previous page's form submission and display it here. So if we look back at our username page, the input box we're going to be entering data into has the name attribute set to login FMT. So whatever data the user submits on this page here will be displayed on the second page to help mimic common login experiences. So we're halfway through the campaign makeup at this point, we've taken a look at emails and pages. All we've got left is target list and profiles before we're ready to send. We go back to our Casterly Rock workspace at this point and get our target list prepped. We'll make a new list and you can either add users one by one here by adding their information in this line and clicking the plus button, or you can upload a CSV file. So I'm just gonna do that to save some time. Call the list the Lannisters. And you can see this was filled out already with first name, last name, and email. Email is the only required value. Um, first and last name are available, though, if you want to be able to reference the F name and L name type variables in your email template. So we'll go ahead and create this, and this is going to be who we're sending to when we kick off our campaign. Profiles are our last required component to start a campaign. Similar to when we took a look at pages, the profile we want to use is being housed in the general workspace. Instead of navigating back to the general workspace and looking at it there, I'm actually going to import it over to our current Casterly Rock workspace. So now our profile has been imported to our current workspace. We can take a look at it and make some edits. Also change how it looks like when the user receives it. And down here you can see we've got the SMTP host, port, username, and password, and we're also specifying we're going to be using a TLS connection. Save this and the test email to make sure that our profile is working. Great, so now that our profile is successfully working, we're ready to go generate a new campaign. So the campaigns component show us our, our three previously run campaigns. All of these are completed, so none of them are active anymore. Go ahead and create a new campaign up here. And the first set of options we're presented with are our hosting options. So we'll select our domain that is going to host our phishing site, westerisupport.com. We can see the IP that that domain resolves to. And we'll also select our server, which is gonna be worker one. Uh, also the IP address that our domain resolves to. If we try and select another worker that has a different IP address, and continue we will be forbidden from doing so so we'll go ahead and select worker one we can also specify the port that we want to host the campaign off of as well as whether we not whether or not we want to use ssl and this will reference the cert path supplied on the domains and servers page for the chosen domain moving on to our scenario options we'll go ahead and specify a campaign name and select our email template. We'll do our cloud email update. And optionally, you can also attach a file here. I'm not going to do so for this scenario, but it's there. This is what I, what I was mentioning earlier when I said that you can choose to specify up to four pages per campaign to be used in sequence. So we'll go ahead here and select our username page and then sequentially our password page so that once the user has submitted a username, they're presented with our password page. You could take this a step further and show a success page or something like that. 
I've never used all four pages here, um, but the option is there if you have a complicated scenario that requires something like that. Optionally, we can also specify a redirect URL. So after our last form is submitted, we can take them to the actual login page that we've cloned. I'll just go ahead and specify here, schneiderdowns.com. And also optionally, we can select some payload config. So we can pick a payload file that we've uploaded to Worker1 previously. And also specify the trailing URL path that that payload will be hosted on. I'm not going to do that here. Well, we'll run through another scenario in which we do configure these. But this is what the payload URL variable that you can use in your email templates and your page templates is, is going to link to eventually. And last, we have our sending options. So we'll pick our list that contains our target email addresses, the Lannisters. We'll pick our sending profile. So we'll go with the PyCell profile we imported into the Casterly Rock workspace. And optionally, we can also specify some batch sending. So we could send two emails through at a rate of, or on an interval of every 60 minutes here, if we don't want to blast our target with all emails at once. If we leave these configs blank, um, all emails will just be sent at one time. Also optionally, we can choose to start the campaign in the future. I'm not going to do that here. Uh, if you leave this blank, it'll start right now. And with that, we'll go ahead and launch our campaign. So we'll give it a couple seconds here. We can see our campaign's been added to the campaigns page. And we'll give it a moment. And when we click refresh, we should see that uh, this campaign status changes to active. Okay, there we go. We can see we've also got an option now to kill a campaign and end it. We'll head over to the results component again and just filter down to our newly run campaigns. We can see all four emails have been sent. All four are currently unopened. We'll browse out to one of the inboxes here and log in. And simulate someone getting fished. We'll log in to Cersei here, and we can see we've got an email from Master Picel. We trust everything from Master Picel. We'll go ahead, we'll download the external images. We'll click the link, and we're presented with our sign in page here. So we can see we're at westerisport.com with the trailing URL path that we provided, and also Cersei's unique ID. We'll go ahead, provide our email address. We can see our variable pass through here to the second page. We'll go ahead and enter our password in. And we're hit with our redirects. So let's go back over to the UI here. And we can see the statistics are actually already updated. We've got a little information on CRC. So we can see the timestamps of everything, she, all the actions she took here, as well as the IP address that's all coming from the user agent. And if we come down here, we can see the user and password submitted. So while our cred harvesting campaign is running, I've got a couple more templates rigged up to do payload fish that should automatically drop a file to the user's file system when they browse out to the page. Let's go ahead and configure that to run real quick. Use bravelsogistics.com. We'll run that off of Redler worker number two. Again, we'll use 443 and SSL. Go ahead and name our campaign, select our email. And again, I'm not going to attach the payload directly to the email. I'm going to specify it down here in the optional payload settings. Again, we'll send it out to the Lannisters. We'll use our Bravos Logistics profile, and we'll just leave all this blank to send all the emails out at once. We'll give it a couple seconds here, and we should see the campaign flip to active on our DEF CON worker 2. There we go. Come back over here, filter down our results to 
just this campaign. So we've got one email left to send. Okay, all emails have been sent out. Come back to Cersei's inbox, check her email. She's got an invoice here from Bravo's Logistics. Download the external images. So billing department's waiting to process the order before it can be shipped to Casterly Rock. We'll go ahead and download our invoice so we can fill it out. Come out to the page here and our invoice automatically downloads. So we'll head back to Redler, refresh our stats. We can see we've got the download track on Cersei. And we can see all the information on where that's coming from. So with our campaigns having run their course, we can come in here. We'll go ahead and kill both of these campaigns, take them down. This page should no longer refresh. And if we come back to our domains and service page, we check worker one and worker two. We should see that no campaigns are running on ports 443. That wraps up our demo. I'll flip back to the PowerPoint briefly here just to cover a couple potential to-dos. So a couple things we're thinking about adding into Redler would be the ability to relay emails through a specified Redler worker. But the way things are currently set up, your Redler console is always going to be the IP address reaching out to the specified SMTP server in your profile configs. And sending emails that way. So if something were to happen to the reputation of your console's IP address, it could potentially affect its ability to send emails. Adding in the ability to specify a worker to send the emails for your console would add a little bit more redundancy and uh, work for that, that burnability of the workers. Another thing would be to potentially add in a mechanism to direct users to different web pages or scenarios based on the visiting user agent. So say you're potentially running a, a payload phishing campaign and a, a, a user visits your site from a mobile, mobile device. Detecting that via the user agent and then potentially redirecting these mobile users to a credential phishing attack would, would be something that we'd like to add in in the future. Also the ability to specify IPs associated with products such as Microsoft, ATP, Proofpoint, Mimecast, anything that may be going out and probing some of your phishing sites to determine if it's got malicious files being served or if it's got credential harvesting forms, anything like that. Putting, putting a specified IPs or ranges in and then redirecting these IPs to harmless sites. Kind of along that line also would be delaying the weaponization of your hosted payload. So when you go in and you select the payload you want to host off your worker and the trailing URL path, potentially replacing that with a dummy payload that could serve for the first 45 seconds or five minutes after runtime. And then after that time has passed, anybody browsing to it, any, any hits for that link will actually drop your uh, real malicious payload. And lastly would be the bypass that's out there for Office 365 safe links using relative URL paths and the HTML base tag to specify your, your domain instead of using absolute URLs all over your email. I'm not sure if this still works. I know this was a thing quite a while ago, something that would be real easy to add into Redler. And that's the end of the presentation. Got the contact info there. As of the time I'm recording this, the GitHub repositories are not public yet. They will be in the very near future, and this is something that we're definitely open to community support on as well once, once this is public. So thanks everybody for watching, and good luck fishing.